Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. Any relationship that needs fixing. If it gets fixed, it's going to get fixed by you. Any relationship that you want to change, the change agent is going to be you. So why am I calling this a relationship series? Because the truth of the matter is, relationships are not 50-50. Relationships are 100-100. You have to look at yourself as 100% responsible for your own destiny. It's Dr. Phil, and you have found your way to installment number two of Relationship Reality Check, which I have subtitled, How Much Fun Are You to Live With? Now, I've got a few questions for you. What if I were to tell you that I could predict with 90 plus percent accuracy right now whether you were going to get a divorce or not? Would you want to know that prediction? What if I told you that you were laboring under some major misconceptions about what relationships are all about and whether or not you were doing the right thing to make yours work or not? Would you want to know the answer to those questions? When we were talking last week, I was going over some things that probably didn't sound relationship-oriented because I was talking about you. And the reason I was talking about you, as you will recall, is I was saying the most important relationship you'll ever have is the one that you have with yourself. Because let's face it, if you don't like you, and you have to drag yourself with you everywhere you go, then you're going to show up with somebody you don't like. And what kind of mood are you going to be in if you're showing up somewhere with somebody you don't like, even if that person is you? And you're with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so that can really get old. It can really irritate you. So the first thing that I said you needed to do is get right with yourself. Get honest with yourself. If there are things you don't like about you, I said we're going to have to talk about changing those things. Remember I said you're a life manager and you have one client. And you have to do a job evaluation. You have to do an evaluation of how you're doing as a life manager. And if you've managed yourself into a life of misery... Depression, loneliness, poor health, financial ruin, constant stress, discord, conflict, then you're doing a crappy job of being a life manager. The problem is you can't fire yourself, so that means you got to coach yourself out of it and stick with it. So I tried to bring your attention to that so you could stop blaming other people and say, look, I'm the one that's managing my life, so if it's not where I want it to be, I need to do a better job. I need to change what I'm doing. From the inside out, I need to stop blaming other people and realize I'm the one that put me here. Nobody made me do this. I chose my partner. I chose my job. I chose my geography. I chose all of this, and only I can change it. So that's why I started focusing on you. Now, assuming that you've been thinking about that, and I certainly hope you have, I want to start talking to you about how that interplays with the relationship you have in your life. Now, I'm going to talk about this as though it's a marriage. This can be your significant other. Maybe you're married. Maybe you're not. Maybe it's your best friend. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's someone else. But I'm going to talk about this as though it is your significant other. It is your spouse, your wife, or your husband. But trust me, everything that I say involves every significant relationship you have. I'm just going to pick one that most people are in, which is a committed relationship with somebody that they've invested their emotions in. Now, I ended our broadcast last week by saying it's possible to predict the outcome of a marriage, whether or not it's going to divorce, with great accuracy. And I'm not just saying that because I've got a really good eye for this. I just have this unique ability to spot things. There's actually been a fair amount of research done on this by some really good 
researchers. One of those is Dr. Gottman, and Dr. Gottman has been researching this for decades, and there's a marriage lab involved. There's all kinds of observation of couples, and longitudinal data has been collected to determine whether or not the presence of certain characteristics predicted who was going to get a divorce and who didn't, or other characteristics predicted whether somebody was going to get a divorce or they weren't. And across time, it's really been narrowed down to certain traits and characteristics that predict whether you're going to get a divorce or not. And I'm going to tell you what they are right now, and then we're going to talk about what to do about them. This has been derived from seven different studies that Dr. Gottman has done And these studies included all different kinds of couples, those that were divorced, those that remained together that were happy, and those that remained together that were miserable. And from these studies, Dr. Gottman found that couples that eventually get divorced tend to have conversations about conflicts with one or more of the following features. So I want you to think about these, write them down. They're going to be on the website, but you need to ask yourself, do I have one or more of these following features in my communication pattern with my significant other? And if you do, then I can tell you that you're likely to get a divorce, and I can tell you that with 94% accuracy. Now think about what I just said. If you do one or more of the six things I'm getting ready to tell you, Research says there's a better than 9 out of 10 chance you're going to wind up getting a divorce. And that means one of two things. You either just ought to go ahead and get it now and save yourself the trouble, or you better change what you're doing. So what's number one? Number one is couples that tend to wind up getting a divorce manage conflicts with what is called a harsh setup. Now, what we're talking about here is there is an obvious sign from the get-go, from word one, that this conflict is not going to go well because it starts with sarcasm and other negative forms of communication. That can be criticism or other expressions of contempt. And when I say sarcasm, it can be mocking the other person, mocking the way they talk, mocking what they say. It can be, you're just like your father. Oh, you're just like your mother. How does anybody ever respond to that? I mean, you're attacking their parent. So if it begins with a very harsh setup where there's sarcasm, mocking, criticism, character assassination, where whatever the issue or topic was, that has been pushed to the side. This has gotten personal, and there is an attack on the individual's character, worth, and value. People that do that in arguments wind up divorced 94% of the time. Number two are the four horsemen. And these are four forms of negativity that have been shown to be so devastating to a marriage that Dr. Gottman referred to these as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And these are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. And by the way, they actually occur in that order. It starts out with criticism and then contempt for the other person, which draws defensiveness from the other person And then they wind up just stonewalling. It's just like the garage door comes down, and now you're just talking to a wall. Conversation dries up. I got nothing to say to you. They shut down mentally, emotionally, physically, and typically withdraw from the situation. So the four horsemen are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling in that order. So think about your conflict patterns. Because it's not just that this happens once. If this has happened once in your relationship or it happens once a year or occasionally, that doesn't mean you're going to get a divorce. But if these things occur in pattern, this is the pattern with which you communicate and deal with conflict. That's when you can predict that they're going to lead to divorce. So ask yourself, what's your pattern of communication with your significant other? Do you go at it constructively? Do you problem solve together? What is your objective when you have 
a conflict or a disagreement. You see, some people have a disagreement. They have an argument over we're going to do A or B, and their objective when they enter the conflict is to win. And you're probably thinking, well, of course my objective is to win. Why else would I be in this argument? Well, let's just unpack that for a minute. Let's say you get into an argument with your significant other, and let's assume that this person is your significant other because you value them, you love them, you care about them, you nurture them, you wish them well. But then you get into an argument and you want to win. Well, let's extend that out. If you're going to be a winner, what does that mean they're going to be? If there's a winner, there has to be what? A loser. Do you like to lose? So do you think they like to lose? How do you feel when you lose? You feel down, depressed, broken, resentful. I mean, I think about winning and losing because I grew up in athletics. And I remember walking down the hallway in high school and we were going to play the Titans. The signs on the wall would be crush the Titans, you devastate the Titans, annihilate the Titans. This is Jess Betancourt, the host of DNA ID, the only true crime podcast that exclusively covers cases solved using forensic genealogy. DNA ID goes behind the headlines to answer your questions about this remarkable new crime solving tool, how it works, how cases are selected, why the cases were unsolved for so long, and how the justice system is addressing it. I include input from law enforcement to give you the inside scoop that we all crave with a straightforward, no nonsense delivery. You can find DNA ID on any podcast platform. Episodes come out weekly on Mondays. I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. (laughs) The foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started this podcast. Stop saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. (laughs) So the idea was you just wanted to stomp them into a mud hole. You wanted them to get on that bus with their heads hanging down, their tails between their legs, saying, man, they crushed us. We don't ever want to come back here again. They dominated us. Well, that's because it was a competition. And if when you have a disagreement with your partner, it becomes a competition, then there's going to be a winner and a loser. So, I mean, what are the banners in your head? Devastate Debbie. Dominate Debbie. Trounce Debbie. I mean, is is that really what you want to do? I mean, is this a win-lose situation? And then let me appeal to your greed. What kind of company is a loser? You win the argument. You dominate, devastate, trounce Debbie. Now you have the rest of the evening stretched out ahead of you. What kind of companion is she going to be? Is she going to be a lot of fun for the rest of the evening? Is she going to be real happy to be around you? I mean, you just stomped her into a mud hole. I mean, is she going to be like, oh, hey, let me sit in your lap. I I so trust you with my feelings and emotions. Of course not. She's not going to want to be around you. And when she is, she's going to be defensive and shut down. She's going to stonewall you, the four horsemen. You say, well, then what is an argument if you're not going to try to win? What if instead of your goal to win, you make it your goal to be heard? H-E-A-R-D, heard. I want you to hear my point of view. I want you to acknowledge my point of view. And then you do with it as you will. And I will hear your point of view. And then let me do with it as I will. So the conclusion of this disagreement is going to be that we have heard each other. Heard, H-E-A-R-D, not H-U-R-T. I know this is audio, so I want to be clear. The objective is that we have heard each other. So if your objective is that you hear your partner and that they hear you, then you retreat. And across time... I promise you're going to find that if you truly love one another, you're going to get out of the combat zone and you're going to try to find some middle ground 
where you can accommodate as much of what your partner wants as you possibly can, and your partner's going to accommodate as much of what you want as they possibly can. And that means both of you are moving towards the middle, and you're going to narrow the gap of difference a whole lot more than you think you can. And sometimes you'll do 75% of the compromise and your partner will do 25. Maybe the next time your partner will do 75 and you'll do 25. But across time, you tend to find that middle ground where you find ways to coexist. You find ways to live together, whether it's differences about parenting, about spending money, about in-laws, religion, sex, whatever it is, you tend to find a way where you're sensitive to each other's position, but you give each other a face-saving way out of the conflict, you reflect on it, and you know later we're going to talk about how to fight fair, rules of fighting fair. But before we actually get down to tactics, we have to first talk about the strategic approaches to this. So you can see why the first two things that predict divorce are the harsh setup sarcasm, criticism, contempt, and then the four horsemen, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. The third of six predictors is called flooding. And this is a term that describes the overwhelming and sudden nature a partner's negativity can take, particularly in the form of them just blasting you with both barrels with character assassination, all of this contempt and criticism that they bring. Defensiveness can have the same effect, but this is when everything just goes off the rails and it's just all out war at this point. There's no consideration for the feelings of the other person. It's just all out war at this point. They get so negative that it's just get them before they get me. I'm going to nail this person. And so the character assassination just takes over as the number one objective. Number four is body language. Look, when somebody is the target of flooding, when they come under attack, and again, the attack is personal, it's character assassination, it is really to devastate them, their heart rate is going to go up. I mean, it's going to go over 100 beats a minute. It's going to go as high as 165 beats a minute. Their blood pressure is going to shoot up. Adrenaline is going to spike. They're going to go into fight or flight mode. There's no problem solving now. There's no reasoning. They are in fight or flight. It's like, okay, put them up. We're going to have a verbal knockdown drag out here, or I'm getting away from you. I'm out. I'm gone. Fight or flight. It's one of our most basic reactions. And that's what happens when you are attacked in a character assassination kind of way. The fifth of six that predict divorce is failed repair attempts. Remember I said this was a pattern? When I say it's a pattern, I'm talking about this has to occur overnight. Even as powerfully negative as flooding and the four horsemen, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling are, they don't seal the fate of a marriage in one bad night. There has to be a pattern of this. And when there's a pattern, it has to be followed by failed repair attempts, where the person makes half-hearted attempts, insincere apologies, doesn't really come in and repair the damage that has been done. And failure to do so, failure to really come in and acknowledge what took place and how bad an idea that was, is a reliable sign that divorce is in your future. Because the wounds never heal. And you have these open wounds. It's like your psychological skin has been burned. And so now it doesn't take much to offend the other person. It's just like you can come up and pat them on the back and they're like, oh, man. They react because they're still hurting from the last time their character was attacked and assassinated. So failed repair attempts are a critical factor. And then number six All you have to do is interview the two people in the relationship independently and find out if they have a backlog of bad memories. Do they have a backlog of bad memories? Because if what sticks out in their mind, what they have in their memory bank is one painful experience after another, 
it blocks out the good times. It's the big blow up and then the next big blow up and what happened at Christmas and how things went bad on one of their birthdays and what happened on over the 4th of July and just negative, 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 negative. If they have a backlog of bad memories, that is a strong predictor of divorce. Look, no couple is going to have a success-only journey through their marriage. It just doesn't happen. Everybody is going to have conflict. Everybody's going to have problems. It's never going to be success-only. But couples who have more good times than bad, couples who have fond memories, tend to have a happy marriage because they relish those good times. And you've heard me say a million times, the best predictor of future behavior is relevant past behavior. So if your history is positive, your memory, your history in your mind is positive, then you predict a positive future. But if what you have in your head is a negative historical perspective, then you're going to predict a negative future, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the six things that predict whether you're going to get a divorce or not all have to do with how you handle conflict. And the presence of one or more of these things predict whether you're going to get a divorce with 94% accuracy. They are a harsh setup that's marked by criticism, sarcasm, and contempt. The presence of the four horsemen, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Flooding where you just do all-out warfare and overwhelm the other person with criticism and contempt. Body language where the person that is attacked goes into fight-or-flight mode and their biology just takes over and they shut down because they feel like the enemy is at the gates. Five is the failed repair attempts, where there is this pattern and it never gets healed. And six, the bad memories that are left behind that leave that person feeling like, yeah, there's more of this coming, and I just can't take it anymore. So you need to do an assessment on your marriage, your relationships, And if any of those six are present in a pattern-like way, then that goes on the top of your to-do list. Look, I believe that 50% of the solution to any problem lies in defining it. And when I ask a lot of people over the years, tell me the state of your marriage. They can give me an incident that happened. They can tell me how they feel, or the pain that they're experiencing, but they cannot articulate the state of their marriage. They can't tell me what the issues are that are undermining their marriage. They can just say, it hurts. I don't like it. I'm unhappy. We have a lot of conflict. They say, why is that? Well, we just do. Well, why is that? What are the issues? Sometimes they'll give me a few topics, but no issues. And I can assure you, When you fight about everything, you're fighting about nothing. You have damaged each other. You have assassinated each other's character. Maybe you've carried forward a generational legacy. You have learned what you've lived. You grew up in a house that was combative, so now you're just replicating that in your own home. I don't know, but you need to know. When I say, how's your marriage, and you talk about your pain, that doesn't tell me anything. I can't stop your pain if I don't know what's causing it. 50% of the solution to any problem lies in defining it. What is it? What's working in your marriage? What's not working in your marriage? What are the assets? What are the liabilities? You've also heard me say life law number four, you cannot change what you do not acknowledge. What do you need to fix? Not what your partner needs to fix. What do you need to fix? My dad used to tell me when I was really in my late teens and early 20s, He used to tell me, boy, you need to spend 5% of your time deciding whether you've got a good deal or a bad deal, and 95% of your time deciding what you're going to do about it. And that was wise counsel, because sometimes it is what it is. World's not fair. Life's not fair. It just is what it is. And so some people spend 95% of their time lamenting how unfair things are. I've never been so afflicted. I do spend 5% of my time saying, well, this isn't fair. This isn't right. I I hate this. This really pisses me off. 
but that's about 5% of the time. Then I deal with reality and say, okay, what am I going to do about it? So maybe your marriage is hell. Maybe you're living in an emotionally barren relationship. Maybe it's not meeting your needs. It's not giving you what you want at all. Okay, what are you going to do about it? Maybe you married the wrong person. Maybe your partner married the wrong person. But that's where you are. And maybe you got married and then had kids, or maybe you had kids and then got married. But you are where you are. What are you going to do about it? And there are things you can do about it. I want you to do something for me. I'm going to put this on the website because there's something I want you to fill out. It's called a personal concepts profile. This has the stem of 42 sentences, just the stem of 42 sentences. I want you to complete these sentences. The important thing is that you are brutally honest because you can write down softball answers. You can write down goody two-shoes, fluffy answers because you want it to look good. But here's the deal. This is for your eyes only. Nobody's going to see this but you. Later, I'm not going to say, okay, now trade these with your partner. No, no, this is just for you. But it's important that you write it down. It's not enough that you just answer it in your mind because I need you to remember what you wrote down first impression. I need you to go back and look at it. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute, but you're going to have to write these down. I'm going to give you a few examples of the kind of sentences I want you to complete. I tend to deny blank. I am happiest when blank. I hate it when blank. When I get angry, I blank. If only I had blank. My worst trait is blank. I feel like a phony when blank. I can't forgive, blank. Men, blank. Women, blank. If only, blank. Now, those are maybe 10 or 12 examples out of 42, but I want you to fill out all 42. And it's very important that you write these down because it will give you a whole different perspective on how you look at things. Because then I'm going to have you go back and look at your responses to 4, 6, 7, 16, 17, 24, 25, and 31, and that's going to tell you a lot about anger in your life. And then I'm going to have you look at the answers to another subset of questions that's going to tell you a lot about fear in your life. And then another subset is going to tell you a lot about loneliness in your life. A fourth subset is going to tell you a lot about blame and forgiveness in your life. And then a fifth subset is going to tell you a lot about your dreams in your life and relationship. And all of that's going to be on the website. So the 42 statements are going to be there. And then this key that says, look at these specific answers to get some insight into anger, fear, loneliness, blame and forgiveness, and your dreams. It's going to tell you an awful lot. And then while you're on the website, I want you to do a relationship health profile. And these are 62 true-false questions. You can go through them very quickly, and I want you to go through them quickly. I don't want you to debate the answer. I want your first gut-level impression. And there are items like, I am satisfied with my sex life, true or false. My partner thinks I'm fun to be with, true or false. I am out of control, true or false. I feel picked on and put down, true or false. My partner respects me, true or false. I feel judged by my partner, true or false. My partner wants to hear my stories, true or false. I envy my friends' relationships, true or false. I feel needed by my partner, true or false. Those are just a few examples. Then I'm going to have you go back 
and count up the number of true responses you gave to even-numbered questions and false responses you gave to odd-numbered questions. And then there's a key in there that tells you what your score means. And there are going to be categories. If your overall score is above 32, you are in extreme danger of failing. If it's between 20 and 32, you have seriously troubled relationship. You may be living an emotional divorce. If you're between 12 and 19, you're probably about average, which is not great, certainly needs work. And if you're below 11, you're well above the norm and probably only have isolated areas you can improve. So those are some areas that I'm going to want you to look at in the beginning so you can get some real insight to where you are. Because as I said, I ask people, how's your relationship? And they go, tell you where we fight and what we fight about. But we really don't know. You're not really able to answer it. There's one last thing I want you to do while you're there, and it's pretty short. It's true or false, and there are only 10 questions. It is a relationship chemistry test, and I'll give you just a couple of the questions to give you a flavor of it. I am no longer physically attracted to my partner. Sex with my partner is energetic and satisfying. At various times, I resent my partner. My partner and I no longer kiss and caress. Those are all true or false. There's just going to be 10 of those, and then I'm going to tell you how to score it and what it means so you can tell where you are chemistry-wise in your relationship. Has the sizzle gone out? That's what you want to know so you can put something on your to-do list. Now, that's all on the website. But now, I've got some tough questions for you. And you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute. What have you been asking me so far? (laughs) You've been asking me, (laughs) do I still have sex with my partner? You've been asking me true-false questions about, do I still care about my partner having me finish sentences that are really hard to finish? And now you say you're going to ask me five tough questions? Well, yeah, I am. These are essay questions. These are not yes or no questions. But here's the deal. You've got to be really candid with yourself here. And again, I'm going to tell you, later on, I'm not going to say, okay, now trade journals with your partner. No way am I going to say that. In fact, when we get through with this, you may want to shred these. (laughs) You may want to take these out in the field somewhere or go get a garbage can somewhere and burn these because this is where you can be completely candid with yourself. And I say that because, as I've said, you cannot change what you do not acknowledge. So we've got to get really, really real. And if you were listening to my Living by Design series, and if you haven't, I highly recommend it. One of the things I said was consistent among champions is they deal with the truth. The same thing is true here with relationships. There are just two things worse than being in a bad relationship. One thing worse than being in a bad relationship is being in a bad relationship and lying to yourself about it, being in denial about it. And the other thing worse than being in a bad relationship is knowing about it and doing nothing about it. You're not in denial. You know it. You've admitted it, and you don't do a damn thing about it. I've said before, the only thing worse than being in a bad relationship for a year is being in a bad relationship for a year and one day. And you don't want to do any of these negative options, so that means we've got to be honest. And here's the first of the tough five questions. Now, look, love is has probably been decoupaged on everything you can get decoupage on. Every t-shirt that you can buy, love is a box of puppies. You know, love is watching the sunset together. But let me give you a definition that we can use for love for the purposes of our conversation. And at least one definition of love, and you won't see this on a t-shirt because it's too long, is that the security and well-being of your partner is as significant to you as your own security and well-being. Now, what does that mean? It means that you care more about your partner than you do about yourself. Loving someone means you would push them out of the way of a bus and take the hit for yourself. You'd take a bullet for them. You would die for them. You care more about their safety and security, nurturance, happiness, than you do about yourself. 
Okay, if that's one definition, then here's a question. Would you say, based on results, you behave in a way that reflects that you are in love with your partner? Using that definition, that you put their interest ahead of your own, their safety and security is important to you, would you say that based on results, not your intentions, not your thoughts, but the way you have behaved, would you say your behavior reflects the fact that you are in love with your partner? And why do you say yes or no? So I want you to write this down. Why would you say yes or no? What have you done that demonstrates that you love your partner based on our definition? Or what have you failed to do that indicates that you're not in love with your partner? Question number two, using the same definition, would you say your partner is in love with you? And why? What do you pin that answer on? What have they done that makes you believe that they are, in fact, in love with you because they put your needs ahead of their own? Or what have they failed to do? How have they been selfish? How have they pushed you aside and put themselves at the top of the priority list? So I'm asking you to give specific examples. This is based on results, which means it's based on behavior, not intention. Well, I meant to. No, no, no. I want to know what you did. Question number three. Knowing what you now do about your relationship, would you still get involved with this person if you had to do it all over again? Think about what I just said. If you knew then what you know now, maybe you're five years in, maybe you're 10 years in, maybe you're a year in, but if you knew then what you know now, would you have taken the leap? And this is exactly why I say you don't ever want to let your partner... (laughs) read this because hopefully this is going to change. Your answer may be, hell no. Hell no. If I knew then what I know now, not a chance. But that doesn't mean we can't fix this. We can't change that. But let me tell you, if your partner reads that, they'll never get over it. So this is between you and me. If you knew then what you know now, would you still get involved with the same person if you had it to do all over again? If you would do it again, why? And if you wouldn't do it again, why? Be specific. You can't just say yes or no. If the answer is no, why do you say that? Because he has proven to be this or that or the other. Because he does this. He treats me this way or that way. Number four, when comparing yourself to other people in relationships, do you feel that you've been cheated or that you settle too cheap? Now, understand you're comparing your reality to their social mask. They don't call you and ask you to come over and sit in the bedroom when they're having a knockdown drag out. You just see them at a party or at dinner or whatever when they got their smile on their face and they say, can I get you something, honey? Uh, Would you like to sit down, honey? And, you know, maybe 30 minutes later, it's like, you know, I hope you die. But I'm just saying, based on what you see, do you think you've been cheated or that you settled too cheap? And again, I ask that realizing You're comparing apples and oranges, but I'm interested in your attitude, whether you feel like you've been cheated or settled too cheap, and if so, why? What is it you think you see in other people, in other relationships, that you didn't get? And again, you have to write this down. And then the last question, number five. If you could break off your relationship right now, if you could get a divorce from your partner right now, Without any inconvenience, no legal cost, no embarrassment, no undue hardship on your children, if you could just wave a magic wand and undo it all, would you do it? Now, this is different than what I asked you before. What I asked you before in number three was, if you knew then what you know now, would you have done it then? I'm asking you now today, if there was an exit ramp that was pain-free, Would you turn on your signal and take that exit ramp? And if so, why? And if the answer is no, I would not turn on my signal, get over in the right lane, and take that exit ramp. If the answer is no, why? What is it you get from this relationship that would make you stay? It's very important that you answer with specifics both ways, whether you would stay or whether you would go. If you would go, Spell out why. If you would stay, what are you getting out of it? You need to acknowledge that. You need to write that down so you understand it. Now, why am I going through all of this? I'm going through all of this because I want you to be able to answer that question because people can't articulate the state of their marriage, the state of their relationship. 
They can talk about the pain. They can talk about what one has done or said, but they can't really give you a state of the union, the union being the union between the two of them. They can't really do that, and I want you to be able to do that, because if you can't do that, you don't know where you are. It's like you're lost in the dark, and you don't know where you are. Okay, I've asked you to do a lot of soul-searching. I've asked you a lot of questions and asked you to evaluate where you are. Now, why is that? Because you can't figure out what you need to do, where you need to go, what levers you need to pull, which steps you need to take if you don't know where you are. Like I've said so many times, if if I answered the phone and somebody said, "Uh, hi, I, I just dialed a random number. Can you tell me how to get to 3rd and Elm? What's my first question going to be besides why are you calling me? My first question is going to be, where are you? Because if they're talking about 3rd and Elm in my town, wherever my town is, I need to know where they're starting. Because the directions are going to be a lot different if they're in El Paso, Texas, than if they're in Bangor, Maine. I mean, it's going to be a lot different because the first turn is going to be right. If they're in El Paso, it might be left if they're in Bangor, Maine. So I have to know where you are before I can tell you how to get where you're going. You have to know where you are before you can figure out how to get where you're going. You need to know, are you in love or are you not in love? Are you in constant conflict? Are you living in character assassination? Where are you? Are you in a relationship that you would never get in if you had it to do all over again? Are you in a relationship that you would bail on if you could just afford it? Are you in a situation where you feel that you live with judgment and contempt every minute of every hour of every day? Or are you in a relationship where you feel like, yeah, you know, we need a little brushing up here. It's a big difference knowing where you are in figuring out what you need to do to get where you want to go. So I've been asking you a lot of questions to have you identify where you are mentally, emotionally, physically, attitudinally, because I want us to know where we're beginning so we'll know where we're going. Okay, now let's talk about where we're going. There are 10 myths. I mean, just 10 big myths that I need to blow up here so we don't wind up with unrealistic expectations. And I'm going to tell you why this is so important, and then I'm going to go through five of them, and then I'm going to do the other five next week. Let me tell you why I'm talking about myths. I love busting myths, by the way. But I'm talking about it because it's not what happens in life that upsets us. It's whether or not our expectations are violated, okay? If you get married and you have this Hollywood fanciful sitcom view of what marriage is, and then what you get is just an average typical marriage, you can feel like, oh my God, I've made a horrible mistake because there's no soundtrack that kicks in. There's no laugh track that kicks in. Everything doesn't get resolved in 30 minutes. And you go, oh my God, we must be horrible people. If you're in the infatuation phase and you said, oh, we're so in love, all we need is each other. That's not true. You also need rent money. You got to pay the utilities. You got to both have jobs. You've got to figure out a division of labor. You got to figure out what you're going to do when his mother comes over, when her mother comes over. I mean, it's completely different than the infatuation phase. So if you go into it just thinking we're going to always be in love, it starts out like, oh my God, we know each other so well, we finish each other's sentences. And six months later, it's, yeah, quit interrupting me. I mean, it's completely different. Everything changes across time. So if your expectations are violated, then you're going to cry foul. When in fact, what you may have is fine. You just didn't expect the right thing. So I want to blow up some of the myths that people expect. Because if you don't expect wrong things, then you won't be so upset. And let me tell you, throw logic out the window because we're talking about relationships. When you talk about relationships, you're talking about emotions. And when you're talking about emotions, logic has no place. Emotion takes the place of logic. Myth number one, I love this one. A great relationship depends on a great meeting of the minds. Doesn't that sound lofty? A great relationship depends on a great meeting of the minds. It just feels like, you know, we've got to be birds of a feather, 
that they should be more alike than different. The problem is it's a complete crock. You're not ever going to see things through your partner's eyes. And if you ever have to stop being 100% of who you are to be half of a couple, the price is too high. If you have to stop being you to be half of us, you made a bad trade. It's not going to be a meeting of the minds. You're going to see things differently. Men are going to be men. Women are going to be women. And that's okay. And therapists that try to change that need therapy because that's not the way it works since the Industrial Revolution. No question about it. Most men can do jobs that used to be stereotypically women. Women can do jobs that used to be stereotypically men. I totally get that. But emotionally, we're wired up differently. And here's the good news. I don't want a wife that thinks and feels like I do because, trust me, I do not want to be married to me. Under no theory, under no circumstances, do I want to be married to me. God help me if I was married to me. Somebody that thought like I did, problem solved like I did, reacted like I did, that would be the most boring thing I can imagine. I'm married to someone that is very different, very, very different. And that's a good thing. It's complimentary. The things that aren't natural for me are natural for her. The things that are natural for her are natural for me. And so that works out. You don't have to have a great meeting of the minds. It's not better or worse. Men aren't better because they're one way or another. Women aren't better because they're one way or another. But there are individual differences. You don't have to have a great meeting of the minds. And because you and your partner don't see everything exactly the same way, that's okay. In fact, it's a good thing. Like I said, I do not want to be married to me. Myth number two, a great relationship demands a great romance. Well, that's not true. Look, these things happen in phases. Think about it. When you were first together, that's the infatuation phase. There's a big difference between falling in love and being in love. And it's not that one's better than the other. They're different. Falling in love is fun, right? You stay up till three o'clock in the morning and you're talking on the phone for hours and everything is fresh and new and you're infatuated and you get butterflies every time he or she walks in the room. That's the infatuation phase, the falling in love phase, the honeymoon phase. But that just can't last forever. It doesn't last forever. What happens is you transition to a more comfortable, love, where you're at ease with each other. And one's not better than the other. Trust me, I've been married 43 years. We've been together for 47 years, and we're very much in love. It's not that we're not in love. We're not falling in love. We fell in love almost 50 years ago, but we're still in love 50 years later. But it's very different. We're very comfortable with each other. We love spending time together. We find each other interesting and fascinating in different ways. She's multi-sided and has different interests, and that's what makes her so interesting. But there's a big difference. So if you think the sizzle's gone out of the skillet, well, maybe that's true, but what's it been replaced with? There might have been sizzle in the skillet, but now there's a warm bun in the oven. And I don't mean that in the pregnancy sort of way. I mean, it's just a different kind of warmth and connection and depth of emotion that is shared between two people in a relationship. So there are phases, and one's not better than another. They're just different. You may not want to stay up all night talking to your partner now, which you did 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Now you might get the same pleasure out of keeping each other's feet warm and getting a good night's sleep with your backs up against each other. That can be very rewarding. It can be very comforting. It can be very nurturing. And the number one need among all people is acceptance, belongingness, and feeling that from your partner in a safe, secure, predictable way is meeting man's number one need. What could be more rich than that? So 
if you define great romance as infatuation and falling in love, no, you don't have to have that. And if it's not in your relationship, focus on what is in your relationship, that you can count on your partner, that that relationship is predictable, that it's dependable. Doesn't mean that you can't surprise each other. Doesn't mean that you can't still have some mystery and think of and find ways to keep things interesting. Of course you can. But Robin and I have been married for 43 years, and we have never spoken the D word in our home. Not ever. So you say a little mystery is good? Not about that. We made a decision a long time ago that if we have a disagreement, the relationship is not on the table. That is not the stakes for which we play. So we both know, no matter what happens in this discussion, no matter how mad I get or how upset I get or how upset she gets, when it's all over with, we're going to still be there for each other. That's just not the stakes for which we play. Not now, not ever. And knowing that is very important. So there's a lot of richness that comes from being in love as opposed to falling in love. Myth number three, a great relationship requires great problem solving. Hardy, har, 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 har. I have talked to so many marital therapists, of which I was the worst I've ever met, by the way. That may make you want to hit the stop button and go do something else. I just didn't have the patience for it. But I've talked to so many marital therapists that say, what do you focus on? Well, we, we teach them how to recognize and solve problems. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> How's that working for you? No, you don't. You want to know why the same issues keep coming up generation after generation after generation after generation? Because they never get solved. How many generations do you think it goes back where one part of the couple, either the husband or the wife, thought the other was too harsh with the kids, and their partner thought their partner was too easy with the kids. There was the hard disciplinarian, and then there was the soft place to fall. How many generations think it goes back where kids thought divide and conquer? They knew which one to go to. They knew where to go to get a yes. They knew where to go to get by with something easy. Why do you think that has persisted? Back to the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s. I mean, why? Because it's never been solved. We don't solve these problems. Why do people have conflict about sex? Because we don't all have the same sex drive at the same time. We don't know how to deal with that. Why are mother-in-laws a punchline? Because she is the other woman in the husband's life. She knows him better than you do. She knows what he likes better than you do. She knows how to make macaroni and cheese exactly the way he likes it. She's the other woman in his life. And maybe she doesn't respect boundaries. Do you think you invented that? You did not. That was going on in the 1600s when they saw her coming up the trail on her donkey. Oh, what are we going to do? Well, it's too late to run. She can see the smoke coming out of the chimney. She knows we're here. That was going on then. It's going on now because we don't solve certain problems. They're just inherent to the nature of merging two lives together, and that's okay. What you have to do is just agree to disagree. You just have to say, you know what? I'm going to give you this one because you gave me that one last month. I'm just going to roll with you on this one. You just have to learn to bend but not break. You just have to learn to say, hey, I have to pick my battles, and this is one that can't be won, so I'm not going to pick this battle. Now, here's my favorite. A great relationship requires common interests that bond you together forever. This one's so good, I have to say it twice. A great relationship requires common interests that bond you together. I belong to a club where we play golf, and I see a guy that comes out there every week with his wife to play golf. She is miserable. I guarantee she is miserable. She so does not want to be there. But I promise you, somebody has told them, you have to share common interest. 
you have to get interested in what the other person is interested in to have a great relationship. So she's decided, I've got to go play golf with him. I've seen women that are getting up at four o'clock in the morning, sitting in a duck blind with her husband freezing to death. And I've talked to them 10 times and said, well, did you have a good time this morning? Oh, my God, I'd rather get a root canal. Why are you here? Well, he loves it. And, you know, I, I want to be interested in what he's interested in. No, you don't. Let me tell you. I sleep with my wife. I eat with my wife. I watch television with my wife. I travel with my wife. Now I got to go play tennis with her, too? She doesn't want to do what I do. I guarantee you she wants a break from me. She has interests that I don't have. Like I said, I've been married 43 years. I promise you some of those have got to feel like dog years to her. And I play tennis every day for two, three hours. I am absolutely certain she treasures that time. Oh, my God, he's gone. People have asked me, are you going to retire? Robin answers always, no, he's not. (laughs) Because she doesn't want me here underfoot all the time. We don't have a lot of common interests other than living together, eating together, having kids together, living in the same house together. We travel together. We do everything together. Now I've got to go do these things that she's interested in or she's got to go do the hobbies that I have. She doesn't want to go to the golf course with me. She doesn't want to go down and watch me play tennis. We played tennis together in a doubles tournament one time. It did not work out. We totally looked at it differently. She looked at it as camaraderie. I looked at it as competition. We just looked at it differently. You don't have to share common interest with your spouse. If they go off and do things on their own, great. Support them in doing that. Encourage them to do that. But you don't have to do everything with your spouse. We love our time together. And that's probably due in part because we have time apart. Think about it. You love ice cream? What if you had it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week for a year? My first job was at a pizza place. I worked there for a good while. And then I got fired because I kept forgetting to put the drinks on the ticket. And that apparently was a really high profit item. And so they... (laughs) After telling me about 10 times, I said, all right, uh, sorry, you're you're out of here. So I got fired, but I was 13 and lied and said I was 16. So I guess my brain wasn't quite ready to put the drinks on the ticket. But after working at that pizza place, I couldn't eat pizza for like five years. Because as soon as I smelled it, it was like, oh my God. I was so saturated with the spices and ingredients and everything of pizza, I couldn't eat it again for five years. And then all of a sudden, it was okay. I just started eating it again. But I was so overwhelmed with it that I just lost my appetite for it. I don't want that to ever happen in a relationship. You need breaks. You need time alone to go do something. Go do something with your friends. Go do something in your workshop. Go spend time in the garden or at the library or doing whatever you want to do, whatever your interests are. You need some time alone. I promise you. You need some time apart from your partner. Myth number five, and then we'll be done. And this one is just such a ridiculous myth that I'll be very quick. A great relationship is a peaceful one. I list that as a myth, but I don't really know it's true because I don't think it's ever happened. There is no relationship that is entirely peaceful. People ask Robert and I, do you guys have big arguments? The answer is no. We don't have big arguments because we don't let them get big. We deal with things as they come up. We don't let it build up for 30 days and then go nuclear. We deal with it at the time before it turns into a forest fire. But there are no peaceful relationships. You're merging two lives, two individuals. They're different. And so they're going to get in each other's way. You're going to see things differently and you're going to have conflict. And some of it you'll never resolve. And if your expectation is, I'll never resolve this, I'll just live with it, well, then that's okay. If you don't have the expectation that it's going to be a success-only journey, then you won't freak out when it's not. So recognize there are going to be rough patches. You're going to have some disagreements. Later on, I'm going to talk to you about how to fight fair. When I say fight, I mean argue. I mean disagree. I don't mean physically fight because that's a drop-dead deal-breaker. 
So those are five of the 10 myths that I want you to get clear in your mind. There is no weaker sex. There is no superior way of thinking about these things. We need to embrace the differences. We need to embrace the differences. Now, I told you how you can predict divorce. If you're doing those things, you need to stop. Next time, when we're together, I'm going to tell you something, one thing that can absolutely change the destiny of your relationship. And it has to do with the first four minutes. The first four minutes. Think about that between now and when we talk again. I'm Dr. Phil. Thanks for listening.